This is the new McLaren GT, and it's a little bit like these sunglasses, which are also new from McLaren, in the way that it does things slightly differently. I mean, look at the frames on these and the way the arms work. Also, it's quite lightweight. Car is too, compared to normal GT cars, such as an Aston Martin, DBS Superleggera, or a Bentley Continental GT. Now, these glasses, they're a £1,000, in case you're wondering. The car, that's £163,000. It's going to get a lot more expensive with some options as well. More on that later. Now, before we get into the review, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Hit that bell icon to turn your notifications on. And also check your mobile phone settings to make sure you're allowed to receive notifications from YouTube. Yeah, it's a right old palaver, but you need to do that so you don't miss our latest uploads. Let's kick off this review by talking about the McLaren GT's design. So there's no active rear spoiler like you get on the 720S. Instead, it's integrated into the boot lid. You do have a diffuser at the back and you'll notice the exhausts are lower than in other McLarens, and of course McLaren being McLaren. They are indeed real. They pass the car wow stick of truth, oh yes. Matt, that stick's just not good enough. Hey, how about this then, look. This piece of log, that, that'll fit in there as well. McLaren doesn't mess around with fake vents. Every vent or port on this car has a purpose. Now these wheels at the back, they're 21 inches, the biggest ever fitted to a McLaren. At the front you get 20s. But looking down the side of the car, you can see it's really long. So this car is 4.7 meters long, which is the same as an Aston Martin DBS Superleggera. But the design is completely different. It's got this teardrop shape, which helps aerodynamics. And the reason it's got that shape is because the engine is there in the middle. That's important, you see. This is a GT car, good for carrying you over long distances. But when you get close to your destination and there's some twisty roads, you can drive it like a proper supercar. Now moving to the front, the bonnet is actually pretty short, sure, isn't it, for a GT car? Once again, that mid-engine design means that you don't have to have a big long bonnet because there's no engine under there. And the front of the car is clearly a McLaren, although slightly different to any other McLaren we've seen before. There's so many flies on here, I'm getting constantly bitten. Here in the front of the McLaren GT, it has more of a supercar vibe than a Grand Tourer, and I like that. So the design of the dash is very, very sporty with the air vents like this. Everything's really easily laid out, so all your driving controls are here, your infotainment's there, all like your lights and stuff are here. It's super easy to use. Then you've got all like these curves about the place, very mclaren -y, and I like the way you've got ambient lighting here and here, and you can change the color of that as well. The materials are very, very lovely, and everything feels solid on on the whole. I like this feature as well. The sunblinds feel expensive, very boutique-like. And look at this, the little vanity mirror, the way it flops down. I like that as well. It's just a shame there's no light for it. I'll tell you what's a shame as well. Look at this, the rear view mirror. If only it felt as posh as the vanity mirror. It's like something out of a dacha. Yeah. Also, my cameraman doesn't like this piano black plastic here. I don't mind it, but it does scratch quite easily. So a few complaints, it's not perfect, but on the whole, it's quite nice. And that's not so nice. Though these, although they are optional, these pedal shifters, they are blooming lovely, solid aluminium. They just feel great. So too do these optional knurled vent controls as well. They're lovely and cool to the touch. It's very, very nice. In fact, that brings me onto this car's specs. As standard, you get a central infotainment screen and a digital driver's display. And you can flick through different menus on that and also change the look of it depending which mode the car is in. There's also extended leather, which is very luxurious. And of course, you get four LED headlights and tail lights. This car has quite a few options fitted to it. It has the Lux Pack, which is £9,990 and it includes things like electrically operated seats. Otherwise, they're just manual and you get extra soft aniline leather pretty much everywhere, including here on the sill finisher, though it seems to be easily scuffed. Do you like this green metallic paint? Well, it's £4,000. If you specify the premium pack, which includes lots of extra bits and pieces, such as this lovely Bowers & Wilkins 12-speaker stereo, it'll set you back an extra £4,900. And when you add up all the options fitted to this particular car, they come to almost £34,000, taking the total price to £197,000. Let's continue this review by talking about the infotainment system. So it's all new for McLaren and it's pretty easy to use. It's very much like your mobile phone. So you have your home button and you can just scroll through different functions and apps. Normally the screens on these things are super laggy, but look at that. It is just like your mobile phone. It is as quick. Maybe the screen resolution isn't quite as sharp as things like your latest Samsung S10 Plus, but it's not bad at all. My only complaint with this infotainment system is the fact that it doesn't have Android Auto 
nor Apple CarPlay, which is a nightmare. Apparently those systems won't work with this car's screen orientation. What I can't complain about is the seating position. It's always lovely in McLaren's and it's no different here. It's easy to get comfy. There's plenty of adjustment in the seat, though it is a bit of a faff to find the controls of these electric seats, but I can push it a long way back. So if you're long of leg, you'll be fine. Also, there's an all right amount of headroom, so if you're long of body, you'll be fine as well. And of course, you can adjust the steering wheel and it's, it's just perfect. Really, really central, nice driving position. I also like the fact that there's quite a lot of light in here. So the glass area is quite big for such a sporty car. And they've even worked in some little light panels just in between the pillars in the back, which is nice as well. Let's a bit more light in and it improves visibility. In terms of connectivity, it's not great, it's all right. You've got one USB there and a 12 volt socket there. I like this though, look, they've got these little slats there where you can put your mobile phone next to these cup holders. So these cup holders are a bit hard to get to. Though there is a bigger one here if you need it and it can hold a large bottle. There is some netage there where you can store some other bits and pieces. Also, unlike the 720S, look, you have a glove box. It's not exactly the largest, but you do have some boots. At the rear, you have a hurricane. It's the car's cooling system because it's really hot here. You have a boot with 420 litres of space, though the way that space is arranged is quite awkward. As you can see, it's really, really shallow, isn't it? So you need these straps to hold your luggage in place, otherwise when you break, it's going to go flying through into the passenger compartment. And you also need to have specific soft bags to be able to make the use of this space. Good thing about it though, you can fit skis in here. You can fit a set of golf clubs as well, though you need a special McLaren bag, which is the right shape for this. I do like this though, look, the carbon fibre. That's lovely, you don't get that in most cars boots, do you? That's not the only boot though, there's obviously one at the front. So in the front, you have 150 litres of space, which is more than you get in the front of a Porsche 911. When you combine that with the rear boot, you've got 570 litres, which is more than you get in the boot of a Volvo V60. McLaren say you can fit a golf trolley in there. So I think if you can afford one of these cars and you're too lazy to carry your clubs yourself, you can probably afford a caddy. Now there is a 12 volt socket there if you need to charge something, but the real test for this front is whether I can fit in it comfortably and it appears as though I can. I kind of wish that you could remove the bonnet because then I could just be driven along like this, though I'll probably end up with a load of flies in my teeth. And that brings you on to five annoying things about the McLaren GT. Depending on the position of the sun, you get a terrible reflection of the dash in the windscreen. It's very, very annoying. Most modern cars have cameras in here which can read speed signs on the road and they'll tell you on the car's instruments how fast the speed limit is which is kind of important in a car this quick, yet it doesn't have one, so you're never sure how fast you should be going. Considering you have to pay extra for the reversing camera, it's a little bit annoying that the resolution is about as good as a video game from the 1990s. This car constantly makes a weird kind of high-pitched squealy whine sound. It's really annoying. It's as though you've got tinnitus. McLaren doesn't have the best reputation for reliability and yeah, this car has thrown up a fault. It says parking brake fault, call McLaren service centre. So we've got another problem. The infotainment system has frozen. I can't do anything with it. No, no, no. Oh wait, it thinks I'm still doing 66 kilometres an hour. I'm not, I'm stationary. The car is off, the air conditioning and ventilation system is supposedly off, yet yeah, it's kind of still just burbling away. And not great on the launch of the car is it it's not all negative though here's five good things about this car the adaptive dampers which come as standard can respond within two milliseconds but they don't just react they can actually be proactive because they use a special algorithm to work out what bumps they think are coming next to prime the car ready for it this car's mid-engine layer and the fact that you've got a carbon fiber roof means that the center of gravity is about here around your hit point so it feels like the car pivots around you. A normal front engine GT car would have its centre of gravity up there which obviously isn't quite so good for a sporty handling feel. Then there's the weight itself, so this car weighs 1530 kilos which is quite light for a Grand Tourer. Something like an Aston Martin DBS Superleggera is almost 1900 kilos and a Bentley Continental GT well over two tonnes. 
I love the design of the door handle. So you just push your hand in there like that and it automatically opens. Then you lift it up. And of course, being the McLaren, you've got dihedral doors. I also like the fact that you have little door pockets which will fit your sunglasses case so that things don't drop out when you lift the door up. Finally, check this out. You also have soft close on the doors. Et voila. With the optional lift kit fitted, you can raise the nose of the car up slightly. And then this GT has the same approach and departure angles as a Mercedes C-Class, so you can drive it pretty much anywhere you could one of those cars. Being mid-engined, you'd expect the luggage area will get very, very hot. But to counteract that, McLaren has fitted it with some special material that resists heat. Also, air intakes in the side haunches funnel air in here, and apparently the temperature in this luggage area never gets above 40 degrees. McLaren says that about two thirds of this car is all new, and that involves the carbon fiber tub, and also the four liter twin turbo V8 engine, which is reworked over that in the 720S. So it has 620 horsepower, 630 newton meters of torque. It's combined with a dual clutch seven speed automatic gearbox, which drives the rear wheels only. It can do naught to 60 with launch control in 3.1 seconds, and will top out at 203 miles an hour. Right, I'm going to start the driving section of this McLaren GT by testing it out in town. When I say town, I mean the um, French Riviera Boulevard. The first thing you notice is that compared to a normal GT car, you've got a very, very low dash and a short bonnet. That helps in situations like this when I'm trying to edge out at blind junctions. Now, if I was in something else, maybe something like an Aston Martin DBS with that big long bonnet, I would have had no clue whether I was just poking my nose out in front of a fast moving truck. But with this, it's much better, much easier, it's shorter. And you get a great all round view actually, dead easy to drive past cyclists. You can tell exactly where the corners of the car are and it's super comfy. That suspension does a great job over bumps. Obviously everything is in automatic comfort mode. So I'm just chilling, enjoying this scenery there. Look, oh, look the Mediterranean, looking lovely. The steering, not too light, not too heavy, very easy to control. The brakes, they're not overly assisted in town, but they're not jerky. Also, it's got a fairly decent turning circle as well. So if you see something that you like over there, mm, somebody in a bikini, I think I'll go check them out. <laughs> it's not very easy to just do a UE and uh, have a bit of a perv. The second environment you need a Grand Tourer to do well in is long distance cruising. So on the motorway, fast, normal roads, such as the one I'm traveling on now. So it does a good job in terms of comfort. These seats are lovely, the suspension's brilliant. The gearbox shifts gears really nicely as well when you're moving along, it's great. What's not so great though, is the fact that you get a constant drone, I don't know if you can hear it, from the exhaust. So it's like, Mah. and this is it in comfort mode. If you put into sport, it gets a little bit louder still. And it's just there constantly like, oh yeah, I'm here. I'm a V8 with turbochargers with very little character. And there's some other noises as well, like the brakes and stuff. This car just seems to lack the ultimate refinement of some of the other GT cars, like an Aston Martin DBS Superleggera. Another thing that it's lacking is autonomous cruise control. When you're crossing continents, which these cars are supposed to be good at, you're going to want to just cruise down the motorway, which is very boring, and put the car into automatic cruise control and let it do its thing, let it steer you, let it keep you a safe distance from the car in front. This car doesn't have it. It just has old fashioned cruise control. So it just keeps the throttle at the setting you want. That's not good enough, especially when you've got something like a Bentley Continental GT, which does have autonomous cruise control. That McLaren is a bit of an oversight for me. So really what this car is all about is when you finish most of your journey and the road starts to get interesting, then it can entertain you just like any other McLaren. It feels not like a GT car, but a supercar. The chassis balance is brilliant. The steering is spot on. It's hydraulically assisted rather than electrical as well, which just gives you way more feel. And the engine, Blimey! And the brakes are good enough to haul you up. This is a car you can really fling about. It just feels light, nimble, agile. It might not be the most cosseting long distance cruiser, but when you can have fun in it like this, all is forgiven. I mean, this is just epic. 
<laughs> it's a supercar, but every day it really, really is. The gearbox is really good as well. When you change it yourself, it's super fast. Yet when you're cruising, it's nice and smooth. Then there's a different driving mode. So for these kind of conditions, sport is perfect. And that alters the speed of shift of the gearbox and the suspension if you alter the chassis. You can put it into track mode, but really sport is the best for the road. You never get to change the throttle map, but that's fine because it's a nice responsive throttle. Also, you don't change the steering weight, although it does automatically change when you're in town. But really, all you need to be able to change is the gearbox and the suspension. Everything else is bang on. And when you're cailing along, the exhaust note is better. It's quite raucous, quite deep. Yeah, this is such a fun car. It's quite unlike any other GT I've ever driven. So then, what's my final verdict on the new McLaren GT? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should shortlist the GT. It's not one of the most relaxing Grand Tourers, but it's definitely one of the most fun. Just so you guys know, I explained the problems that I had with the GT to McLaren. They checked the car over and found out that it was to do with the infotainment system. And they said that it's because the infotainment system is new, there was a glitch with the software, but all that will be sorted out when the cars go to customers, apparently. <laughs>